in Deuteronomy when God prophesied uh, or had someone prophesy that there was going to be a desire in Israel for a king and there were certain things that the king should not do. And one of them was acquire a lot of wives. And then we have another warning from Samuel. We went through this one when the people of Israel asked for a king. What is the king going to do? He's going to take your property. He's going to take your sons. Elsewhere, it's your daughters. I didn't put the whole verse up here. And then we have one very specific personal warning. When David sinned with Bathsheba and had her husband murdered, God warns David through the prophet Nathan that his own household will be troubled against him and that his wives will take and be taken away and given to another. So this is not a surprise, but I want to set the stage a little bit because at the beginning of this chapter, the last indication we have about how things are going in Israel is actually pretty good. At the end of uh, 1 Samuel 8, verse 15, it tells us that David reigned over all Israel and he administered justice and equity to all the people. And then we have a list of people who are appointed as regional judges or as military commanders. And there's apparently a system set up. And um, before the beginning of chapter 15, maybe 10 or 12 years later, depending on how you do the math, it's all going to fall apart. And it's going to fall apart like this. Sorry, scrolling, millennial. Um, First, uh, 2 Samuel 15, verse 1, After this, Absalom got himself a chariot, chariot and horses and 50 men to run before him. And Absalom used to rise early and stand beside the way of the gate. And when any man had a dispute to come before the king for judgment, Absalom would call to him and say, From what city are you? And when he said, Your servant is of such and such a tribe of Israel, Absalom would say to him, See, your claims are good and right, but there is no man designated by the king to hear you. Then Absalom would say, Oh, that I were judge in the land. Then every man with a dispute or cause might come to me, and I would give him justice. And whenever a man came near to pay homage to him, he would put out his hand and take hold of him and kiss him. Thus Absalom did to all of Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. And at the end of four years, Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow which I have vowed to the Lord in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I lived at Gesher in Aram, saying, if the Lord will indeed bring me back to Jerusalem, then I will offer worship to the Lord. The king said to him, go in peace, which may be the most ironic three words in the whole book of 2 Samuel. They will also be the last three words that David will ever speak to his son. But Absalom sent secret messengers throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then say, Absalom is king at Hebron. With Absalom went 200 men from Jerusalem who were invited guests, and they went in their innocence and knew nothing. And while Absalom was offering the sacrifices, he sent for Ahithophel the Gilonite, David's counselor from his city, Gilo. And the conspiracy grew strong, and the people with Absalom kept increasing. Four years, Absalom is traveling by presidential motorcade. Uh, he's got 50 men. He's got a chariot, very expensive. Uh, if we scrolled back a slide, I could show you that this is specifically what was predicted for kings to do. He's going to get your sons and get them to run before his chariots. Oh, somebody's paying attention. <laughs> um, and so he's doing things that specifically think he that specifically indicate to the people who are watching that he should be the king. He's especially offering judgment. And this thing about, look, your case is right, but there's no one to hear it, drives me nuts as an attorney because I hear this all the time. It is sometimes my job when someone comes to me to say, I'm very sorry that that happened to you, but the law has no answer for you. And they don't want to hear it. So this is a very powerful message. They have a sense in them that they've been wrong, that someone has done evil to them. And they think that there should be justice. And Absalom is not offering justice, but he's offering an illusion of it that's making people turn to him. And he's a man of the people, right? Nobody's allowed to bow before Absalom. They get kisses. So he's saying, 
look at your, he doesn't ever say this, he's too smart for that, he's like, look at your distant king who's hanging out there in the palace, you never see him here in the city gates anymore, all you see is me. We know that Absalom is very handsome, we know he's very charismatic, and we know he is a schemer because he waited two years before he murdered his brother. But there is a striking absence in this chapter of David. You guys might remember when David was hiding from Saul, David would be hiding in a place and immediately somebody would go to Saul and say, David is hiding at that spot. I saw him and all his men. They were grilling hamburgers and singing Kumbaya. Like the, <laughs> Saul is getting really detailed and specific intelligence from all over his kingdom. He's got some kind of a system. Absalom is not hiding. He's in the city gate. Everyone has to go through here if they want to go in or come out. Um, it is similar in some ways to an airport terminal now because everyone had to go through, many people who were traveling, and there would be shops there. There would be a whole bunch of things, and it was traditional for the ruler to sit there or his appointees to sit there and listen to judgments. But David's not there. So there's two possibilities here. Um, why David does not intervene with Absalom. One is bad and the other is worse. One is that David doesn't know what's going on. For some reason, in that case, the system that David has set up in order to watch over his kingdom and make sure that justice is done has failed, and he didn't fix it. He's not doing the king thing right. He's not fulfilling the requirements of the job. Or, even worse, David does know about all this, and has decided it's okay. Maybe David is tired of kinging, or maybe, and this is my theory, he just can't bring himself to confront his conniving, murderous, devious, little jerk of an offspring. <laughs> and we'll see that pattern repeating itself as the passage goes on. So Absalom is able to make this huge conspiracy. He's able to arrange signals, and he's able to get... They didn't have prime ministers in uh, ancient Israel, but Ahithophel would sort of fill that role. What we know about him is that he was an important counselor and that he was considered to be very wise, and maybe that he was Bathsheba's grandfather. So here is someone else who maybe... Now, it's, it's debated. All we know is that Ahithophel is the father of somebody and that someone with that same name is the father of Bathsheba, so the commentaries differ on this, but it makes sense to me. Because Ahithophel has been biding his time, waiting for the way his daughter has been treated to have an opportunity to be redressed. And now he's got it. Because Absalom has stolen the hearts of the people of Israel. And so all of David's sins are coming home to roost. His sin of laziness, his sin of cowardice in the way that he deals with all of Absalom's crimes and before that all of Amnon's crimes and before that all of his own crimes. And so the conspiracy grows and the people with Absalom keep on increasing and David either doesn't know or doesn't care. Verse 13, and a messenger came to David saying, the hearts of the men of Israel have gone after Absalom. Then David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise and let us flee, or else there will be no escape for us from Absalom. Go quickly, lest he overtake us and bring ruin down on us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. In 480 BC, King Leonidas and his very small army of Spartans looked across a battlefield at Thermopylae at a very large army of Persians who were offering that they could go away if they just gave up their weapons. And Leonidas very famously said, come and get him. And he started a tradition that has continued all the way up until last year when President Zelensky of Ukraine, also staring down the barrel of an overwhelming force, stood in his capital with a battle going on less than five miles away and was offered evacuation and said, I don't need a ride, I need bullets. So if this was a movie, we know how this would go. But there's other examples that we could use. King Hezekiah in this very same city in another couple of generations is going to be surrounded by an enormous force of Assyrians. And he doesn't say anything epic. He just goes into his room and prays. And what happens? 
the whole Assyrian army is wiped out overnight by a miracle. And we can even look at David's own life. Because many, many times, nine times by my count in the Bible, when David is facing a crisis, he inquires of the Lord. And he says, what should I do? Should I go to battle? Should I not go to battle? This, that, and the other thing. And that should be verse 14. But it's not. A messenger came to David. Who is this guy? We get names for other people. We, we hear all about Ahithophel, and we hear all about Joab, and we hear all about all of these specific individuals, but some random stranger comes to David and says, you better run. And David runs. And the king's servants said to the king, behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king decides. So the king went out and all his household after him. And the king left 10 concubines to keep the house. And the king went out and all the people after him. And they halted at the last house. And all his servants passed him, and all the Cherethites, and all the Pelethites, and all the 600 Gittites who had followed him from Gath, passed on before the king. And the king said to Ittai the Gittite, now I want to stop here. We have Cherethites, we have Pelethites, and we have Gittites, including one specific Gittite. A Gittite is from Gath. You know who else was from Gath? Goliath. David has, in the meantime apparently hired a Philistine brute squad to maintain order or keep him personally safe. Whatever, I don't know of any law against that. Um, the main point here is that they're loyal to him. They're willing to fight, including this Philistine, Ittai. Um, and all of his servants are looking to him for a decision, and David decides to run. He has loyal troops, he has a walled city, his household is loyal. His guards are loyal. The priests, we're going to find out in a minute, are loyal. And David is going to run. Uh-oh, did it go to sleep? Whatever, don't eat him. Okay. There we go. So, why does David decide to run? Now, you can give David credit here, and a lot of commentators do. He didn't want to fight in the city that he built. He didn't want it to be besieged and have people starve. That was a real disaster. Uh, he would rather fight somewhere else. But that doesn't make sense to me because we've seen this pattern. We know David is no coward. He fought a giant by himself as a teenager with rocks. He fought, he killed 200 men in order to get the girl um, circumcise them awkwardly <laughs> and, and uh, he's been a warrior he's been winning and fighting battles his entire adult life we know he's not afraid for his own personal safety but he is afraid of his son and I see this all the time too because I get calls from parents from significant others from relatives who know somebody who has done something awful and who want my help because they can't get themselves to believe that their loved one really meant it. Oh, she aggravated him so much. Oh, he didn't understand what he was doing. So this is okay, this is normal, right? Obviously parents are sympathetic to their children. If I ever get myself in a bad situation, I hope my parents will still be sympathetic to me, but David's not just a parent. David is the king. And the king has to do justice. And David has not been doing it. And it's come back to bite him. There's no surprise here. David had to know that Absalom was dangerous, and he ought to have known. He either ought to have found out or he ought to have known that Absalom was conspiring against him, behaving like a king. He knows that Absalom is the heir. If anything happens to David, Dave, Absalom will become king, probably. And he didn't do anything about it. David behaved much more like a king while he was on the run and hiding than he ever did once he got that pretty palace and all those wives. And so, that's where God's going to put him again. Uh, we continue. But Ittai answered the king, as the Lord lives, as my lord the king lives, wherever my lord the king shall be, whether for death or for life, there also will your servant be. 
And David said to Ittai, go then, pass on. So Ittai the Gittite passed on with all his men and all the little ones who were with him, and all the land wept aloud as all the people passed by, and the king crossed the brook Kidron, and all the people passed on toward the wilderness. And Abiathar came up, and behold, Zadok came also with the Levites, bearing the Ark of the Covenant of God. And they set down the Ark of God until the people had all passed out of the city. Then the king said to Zadok, carry the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see both it and his dwelling place. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am. Let him do to me what seems good to him. The king says to the, also said to Zadok the priest, are you not a seer? Go back to the city in peace with your two sons, Ahimaaz your son, Jonathan the son of Abiathar. See, I will wait at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. So Zadok and Abiathar carried the ark of God back to Jerusalem, and they remained there. You get disputes about this, because some people think this is a really beautiful moment. David has finally returned to trusting God. I don't buy it. Why? Because David hasn't talked to God. David has not asked God anything. He has not asked anybody else what they think God thinks. He has made all the decisions, working from bad information and his own biases. And he has amazingly figured out that God wants him to do what he was planning to do anyway. This is not unfamiliar to me. <laughs> and I think it's probably not unfamiliar to you as well. Uh, but it's something you got to watch out for. After David has already decided to run, and after David has already decided that uh, he might lose the war, and he's prepared to do that rather than face Absalom, he then says, well, I'll just leave it up to God. <laughs> Nevertheless, David does start doing some king-like things again. He does what he should have been doing for the past 15 years and gets some spies. If it makes you a little uncomfortable that he decides to use priests as spies, it makes me a little uncomfortable too. Um, but they didn't have separation of church and state in uh, the ancient Near East. And uh, this is what David decides to do. And it's the first tiny indication that he's actually decided to fight back. See, David knows that he is God's anointed. And you remember the respect that he had for that. Back when he was pursuing, Saul had an opportunity to kill him. Wouldn't do it. This is the Lord's anointed. But David has also been living in sin. His relationship with God at this moment is zero. And I really believe that David feels shame. That he doesn't want to go to God and say, God, what should I do? Or God, help me. Because he's afraid God will say, why would I do that when you have done nothing but run from me? for decades. And this is a familiar feeling for many of us as well. That terrible shame when you know you've done wrong and you know God's the only one you can fix it and you can't think of a single reason why he would. But this is the encouraging thing about this passage is that God can think of a reason. God did not stop loving you when you failed. God did not stop loving David when he failed. And so in a moment... When David offers his first prayer in this entire crisis, it's going to get answered in spades, even if it's not a very good one. So that's an encouragement from this passage that God, David has abandoned God, but God has not abandoned David. And God may very well be putting David through all of this to cause this exact thing to happen, where David is suddenly thinking about God again. Hasn't thought about him for a long time. Didn't think about him when the emergency happened. Is now out trekking through the wilderness that he apparently hasn't seen in a long time because he's been sitting in his palace, not going out the gate. And God has words to say to David. But David went up on the ascent of the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went, barefoot and with his head covered. And all the people who were with him covered their heads. And they went up weeping as they went. And it was told David, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with, conspirators with Absalom. 
And David said, O Lord, please turn the counsel of Hithphel into foolishness. David does not say, O Lord, please give me my city and my throne back. Or he does not say, please let Absalom get struck by lightning. Or any of the other perfectly reasonable things for him to say in this situation. He does not even say, oh God, keep my family safe during civil war or help the people not to suffer. There are so many better prayers for David to be offering here. And David comes up with one as an outburst. Oh no, it's Ahithophel. He knows all my plans. He knows exactly what I was going to do if there was ever a revolution. He knows exactly how I think he's on the other side. And David panics, and in his panic, he prays. See, David has reflexes. David, when he was young, spent a lot of time relying on God, spent a lot of time trusting God to rescue him from danger, spent a lot of time writing songs for God and worshiping and praising him out there with watching the sheep eat the grass. Uh, There was a lot of time. And David has a trained response here. When his emotions get the better of him, he prays, which is a lot better than a lot of other things that you can do when your emotions get the better of you. And this is another lesson here. All those years watching the grass grow and the sheep eat it were not wasted. David learned habits, and those habits have fallen into disuse while he was far from God, but they never entirely went away. And it's important that we do this, that we train ourselves in peaceful times to be interacting with God in a healthy way on a regular basis, because it will come back when we least expect it. And David, I don't know if David really thinks something terrible is going to happen to Ahithophel. Spoiler, it is. <laughs> this is. This is going to work. The only prayer that we know David offers from the text here during this entire crisis is going to get answered um, immediately. But we also know that David wrote Psalm 3, which is on the screen. Uh, It's actually one of the few psalms with a title. And it says, uh, Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom. So at some point during this crisis, while David is away from Jerusalem, and we don't know exactly when, but I would put it here because David's reflexes have kicked in. He is returning to his roots. He's praying to God. He's writing a song about it. It's not my thing, but I guess if it works. (laughs) And he's going back to that trust in God that he needed because so many other things that he had counted on are not there for him anymore. While David was coming to the summit... Behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat torn and dirt on his head. David said to him, if you go with me, you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and say to Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past, so now I will be your servant. Then you will defeat for me the counsel of Ahithophel. Are not Zadok and Abiathar the priests with you there? So whatever you hear from the king's house, tell it to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. Behold, their two sons are with them, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send me everything you hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city just as Absalom was entering Jerusalem. Absalom has a problem. In fact, he has the same problem David had all those years before when he came to power. Who is really on your side? And David has just, in a very painful way, gotten this wrong because he thought Ahithophel was on his side, but he wasn't. Ahithophel was lurking and waiting for his chance. And so David gets an idea, and he starts doing the things that kings do, right? He has not been doing those things. Every real problem that has arisen for the past, really since the end of chapter 8, Joab has dealt with it, right? From a, from a political science point of view, you could say that the real king of Israel functionally was Joab while David was distracted. I mean, we see in here that David left 
he took most of his household with him, but he left 10 concubines behind. So this is a small fraction. Yes, he's been busy. And he hasn't been doing the things that he needed to do. And now he is again. And I believe that's why I cite the writing of Psalm 3 at this moment on the Mount of Olives, where he's gone to the place where God is worshipped, where he has from reflex or from sort of a spiritual muscle memory offered up a prayer that God will deliver him from this crisis. And then I think he sat down weeping and wrote these words. But I don't know. You can say he wrote it earlier. You can say he wrote it later. There's no proof of this. But narratively, as far as the arc of this chapter goes, that's what makes the most sense to me because this is when David starts seriously interacting with God again. And I don't want to belabor the point, but it's so important to repeat. It's never too late to turn back toward God. No matter what you've done or haven't done, no matter who else has betrayed you, no matter what you've lost or what you've won, God is always waiting for you to come back. And it's only when you forget that that you can get yourself in a situation like David is in here. Because all those other times when David inquired of the Lord, the Lord gave him the right answer and David won the battle. So here we are. David is out in the brush with his loyal band of uh, foreigners who aren't even supposed to be there, with his family, children, um, with all his advisors except the most important one, uh, with the support of the people of the city but no support in the countryside. And he's here because he chickened out in a crisis, because he didn't know what was going on, and above all else, because he did injustice and refused to do justice. And I've talked about some reasons why this story matters for us today. But these, I think, are the most important ones. Nobody is ever going to sneak up a conspiracy on Jesus because Jesus is always watching. Jesus will not fail as David failed. He's not lazy. He's not distracted. And he's not confused. Jesus will never chicken out in a crisis. This is the man that went to the cross, that stood trial three times, didn't say anything in his own defense. And he always has the nerve for whatever the situation is. He will never show the kind of cowardice that David showed, whether David was afraid of the battle or whether he was just afraid of battling Absalom. Jesus is not afraid. But that leads to one that's a little bit less comfortable. It's lots of fun to say that God knows everything. It's a little bit less fun to say that every sin that has ever been done will be punished. Either in hell or on the cross. Jesus will never be soft enough on you, his children, that he will reject justice. And that is why we need him so much because Jesus gave himself up as the victim of that justice and satisfied the demands of a righteous God so that you, King David, can someday return to Jerusalem and be a king again.